using cutting-edge science to feed a growing population. Only 3% of today's land base is used for agriculture. Sharing energy with your neighbors. If there's a market for renewable energy that's produced in a local manner, you should be able to sell to that market. A therapy tool for post-traumatic stress. The protocol that is delivered is meant to bring up original traumatic experiences and actually change the way that the information is ultimately stored. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station. Hi, I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching SciTech Now. According to the United Nations, the global population will grow by more than 2.5 billion people by the year 2050. Scientists are already trying to avoid food shortages by applying high-tech science to traditional farming. A what? We take samples and send them to the lab for analysis to confirm that the gene that was in the parent plant was passed on to these plants. Growing a healthier world for Jenna Osman means studying one leaf, one plant at a time. We are growing these plants for seed production and they'll go to field trials. So anything that performs well here will go on to a field trial for further data analysis. Seed meets soil inside the massive greenhouses of Bayer's Crop Science Division in Research Triangle Park. It's cool to see that uh, something that I've worked on is doing well and going through the pipeline and may eventually become a product. The challenge is to help farmers feed the Earth's expected population of 9.7 billion people by 2050. It's estimated that food production will need to increase by 40 percent to meet that demand. Uh, so it's, a, it's not a situation where we can simply plant more to get more. Uh, why? Because only 3% of today's land base is used for agriculture. That's likely not going to grow with global urbanization, with land degradation. Uh, so it really is about how do we create new ways, uh, new seeds, new production practices, new innovations, new tools, so that they can vastly improve the production on the same land base they have. We'll give this one an... 20%? Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. This one, obviously. Yep. Scan. This one here is 100%. Because traditional farming methods won't dramatically increase food production, scientists use the greenhouses to test new varieties of plants that grow faster, use less water, and are more disease and pest resistant. The goal is to discover new plant varieties that can meet the demands of farmers and food production, while at the same time reducing the amount of chemicals applied to fields. So what we're seeing right now is a term we'll refer to as chlorosis. And so that is yellowing tissue caused by our herbicide. And some of this would recover, some of it wouldn't. But again, for our purposes, we're looking for a perfect plant. We want something with no damage at all, something closer to this plant here, so we don't want to see anything. So as it moves forward, those plants will have a better chance um, with their performance in the field and further on. And sometimes the best way to test for insect tolerance is to get down and dirty in the soil. In the nematode lab, scientists check for, you guessed it, nematodes. It's a tiny worm that chews its way into plant roots, only lives for 30 days, but reproduces so quickly, only a few worms can devastate an entire field of soybeans. Nematodes cause more than $1 billion in crop damage each year. Counting the worms in a soil sample checks for the effectiveness of a new pesticide. There are roughly 70 rooms inside Bayer's multiple greenhouses that allows specific environments from around the world to be replicated. It also means scientists can test how specific plants would grow in each of those environments. Corn is the crop most produced in the world, but it is used for more than just food. Wheat takes up the most acreage. Rice is the most important food crop. Researchers hope to harvest the future of farming. 
First, we get the plants in from our innovation center where they put new traits inside the plants, inside the seeds. We receive those plants and then we want to grow them up until they're big and tall, until they set seeds, because with those seeds then we can do new experiments. So it's basically production sort of goal. Our second goal is really to test how well the plants are performing based on what we put inside the plants. So we're putting new characteristics, new traits inside the plants. Sometimes that means uh, resistance to insects. So our job is uh, to expose an insect to these plants and see if the insect dies. If it doesn't, we got a bad plant, that means into the trash can. If it's a good plant, we'll grow it up until it's big and tall, get seed, and do another experiment with it. Our third goal is, once we kind of have a good result, let's say a plant that's killing an insect, we may need to make a hundred or a thousand variations of that particular plant, of that particular characteristic, to find the really good plant that's gonna hold up on the multitude of different geographies in the US, the different uh, stresses like drought, rain, and so forth. So you need to make a lot of variants, and 999 of them won't be good enough for commercialization towards the farmer, but we're looking for that one. What if you could share energy with your neighbors during a power outage? One company in Brooklyn, New York is working to create energy microgrids that would radically change the way energy is bought and sold. Scott Kessler, Director of Business Development at LO3 Energy, joins me now. All right, so how does a microgrid work? What is a microgrid? So a microgrid is really a physical part of the larger utility network that can sort of separate itself during, the, during a severe weather event, like Hurricane Sandy that came through New York a few years ago, and make it so that people within that area are able to stay powered. If you sort of see photos of Manhattan when the lower half was all out of power, there's little pockets like right around NYU and the southern part of Battery Park that still had some lights on, and that was because they had a microgrid. So a microgrid requires some energy generation. So is this from solar energy? I mean, obviously there's geothermal and hydroelectric, but whatever, but inside a city, uh, is it mostly solar panels that are generating energy? So that's what tends to get the most attention, but really there's a mix of energy sources that are gonna be included in projects like ours. So there are already over about a megawatt of solar energy in the area of Brooklyn working in, Park Slope and Gowanus. But we also want to develop some assets that enable more flexibility because the sun isn't available all the time. So we're looking to install utility scale storage systems and we're also looking to install some combined heat and power. So there's this other s structural hurdle, which is that you and I cannot buy and sell energy to one another. It's just not possible uh, in the legal sense of the word. So how does a microgrid work if there's someone with a rooftop solar that might be generating it and a neighbor wants to use it. So what we've done is we've utilized blockchain technology to come up with our own metering system, which is a combination of meters and computers that sense electron flow and then can write that to the blockchain. So it enables consumers to conduct transactions with each other at a much faster pace, a much more efficient way than they ever could before. So now that we have the technology, all we need now is sort of to get the policy there. And New York is already on the way to doing that. New York's currently undergoing what's known as reforming the energy vision, which is a big initiative of Governor Cuomo and the Public Service Commission to reform the way that utilities conduct business here in New York State. Right now, if I have solar panels, the only thing I can do is offset my own consumption, whereas in the future, you should have a variety of choice. You should be able to offset your own consumption, but if there's a market for renewable energy that's produced in a local manner, which we are trying to develop, that you should be able to sell to that market. And if you want to do other things with that energy, like store it in your battery, you should be able to do that as well. So really looking for more variety for consumers and trying to get utilities to a place where they are enabling that choice. So when you say blockchain, to my mind, Bitcoin is the thing that I associate with it. But Bitcoin fluctuates wildly in its value. Does blockchain require your transactions to be in Bitcoin? So blockchain is really just a type of software. It means that instead of a centralized ledger of information somewhere, like a data center, it's distributed. And that's really what all blockchain software is. Bitcoin's a type of blockchain, just like Kleenex is to tissues. So what we've done is we've taken that blockchain technology and applied it to energy. 
So we're not even developing a financial blockchain. You can't send money to your neighbor through our blockchain. What you can do is send energy in electron, KWH form, however you want to quantify it. Directly back and forth between people. So the utility grid, it's best to think of it as having inputs and outputs. And in the middle, you have all of these wires that are sort of serving as the intermediary. So we can never track an electron and say that I sent my electron directly to you. But what we can do is say, we knew Scott sold five and you bought five. So we can make that transaction happen that way. Where do you see this? Let's say best case scenario, five years out, 10 years out. Uh, do you see more microgrids popping up or do you see larger scale utilities using something like this? So we really see this going towards pushing the concept of exergy, which is the productivity of energy. Right now, we really only look at how much energy did you use. We don't really quantify how did you use it. So we really want to get this to a place where you and I, if we are neighbors, are incentivized to have transactions between us rather than us having to bring power down from Niagara Falls or other large hydro sources. Because from a system perspective, that doesn't make sense. What we want to do is get to a system where there's a big incentive in the network both for you and me as participants and the utilities to have distributed grids, but have them also be resilient and adaptable so that if we lose a pocket of it, it forms a self-healing grid and the rest of us can still maintain power during that outage. So I also hear kind of a Maybe it's a success disaster coming. Let's say lots of microgrids catch on. Then that means that there are pools of people that are no longer contributing to some of those large scale infrastructure costs, right? That it costs a lot of money to build a dam and actually have substations and bring the power all the way here. But essentially if I have parts of Brooklyn and parts of Queens and parts of Manhattan no longer paying for it, then that leaves a smaller pool of people actually paying for all that infrastructure. Wouldn't their rates rise? Well, so there's always going to be a need for there to be wires, for there to be infrastructure, to send these electrons back and forth. And we think the utilities still play that role, and we think they still need to be fairly compensated for that. Additionally, even if we do come up with a system, which I think we're moving towards, where it's a number of community microgrids, there still needs to be a backbone connecting them all. Because some of those microgrids will have excess energy, and they'll be sending it out. Some of those won't have enough energy, and they'll be importing it. So there'll be sort of a market between community microgrids. And while prices may vary, what you get is if there's a really expensive price of energy somewhere, that sends a signal to investors to build more solar, build more storage in that community. So eventually you sort of are using market signals to balance this all out instead of sort of large master planning like we currently do, which doesn't really allow communities to provide what their input is and what their values are. All right, Scott Kessler, LO3 Energy. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Can technology help victims of trauma rewrite painful memories? A team of researchers from the University of South Florida are studying the effectiveness of accelerated resolution therapy, a tool that may improve anxiety and post-traumatic stress among soldiers returning home from war. Veterans returning home often have difficulty adjusting to life after war. One place in Holiday, Florida, makes the adjustment a little bit easier. So the Veterans Alternative is a place where they can reignite that um, familiarity with some of those um, tools that they utilized while they were serving um, on active duty. The camaraderie is definitely one major piece. The physical fitness, uh, nostalgic as well. Um, and then we bring in other pieces to help them overcome some of the um, hypervigilance that they might face after coming home from war. So some of those pieces that we tie in is uh, some of the yoga that we do to help calm the breathing um, and really kind of learn how to meditate and just kind of stance at the moment instead of um, getting anticipatory anxiety. Then we bring in another therapy called Accelerator Resolution Therapy, which is um, absolutely amazing what it does. Uh, it, it saved a lot of warriors' lives, including my own. Accelerated Resolution Therapy, or ART, was created to help people who have experienced trauma. University of South Florida epidemiologist and researcher Kevin Kipp began studying several therapy modalities in 2010. And we designed five studies uh, to uh, use this money that was uh, congressionally appropriated to look for some alternative ways to help service members, veterans, and their families with emotional difficulties. The study with accelerated resolution therapy was one of the five, and over time it turned out to be the most promising. The protocol that is delivered is meant to bring up original traumatic experiences and actually change the way that the information is ultimately stored to replace negative images in the brain and believe it or not replace that with positive images and sensations 
and our brains are wired in such a way that that can be accomplished. It's something called memory reconsolidation. Allison Boysen works at the Veterans Alternative Center as a licensed mental health counselor. Being a therapist for, you know, over 10 years, I've, I've tried a lot of different therapies and some things have worked, but nothing has worked for PTS specifically for anxiety like Accelerated Resolution Therapy does. The ART session starts with the patient bringing up a past traumatic experience. So you ask the individual to bring it up in their mind. Now they don't have to describe it, they have to bring it up. And to start to walk it through from beginning to end, like it's occurring again. While they're doing this, I'm moving my hand side to side, which is helping them to move their eyes side to side. That mimics what happens when we're in REM. A lot of our trauma hangs out in the front of the brain, so to say. And when we're utilizing these bilateral eye movements, we're able to consolidate the memories, put them in long-term storage, so they're not up front, constantly evading them in the here and now. So the next piece is to imagine a way you'd rather remember. The firefight never happened, or my friend was wounded but taken to safety. And they actually walk that through like a movie while following the clinician's hand. And what happens is you're actually changing the original negative images, almost like pasting over them or rewriting them with positive images. They're able to, within an hour, an hour and a half, go through an entire memory, the emotions connected to it, and find relief, put it in the right place so that on a day-to-day -day basis, they don't have to be constantly being exposed to these different triggers, these memories. Jerry Sobleski served in the Navy during the Vietnam War. First tour was on a ship. Second tour, I was what they referred to as a river rat or a brown water sailor. After returning home, Jerry suppressed his memories of war for 45 years. And then once I retired, my psychiatrist theorized that I had a little bit more free time. And then my mind started thinking about what I went through 45 years ago, and then that's when I started really having the problem. Jerry decided to try ART. Makes your brain tired, and you can reprogram it. I don't know how she does it, but she does. After just three sessions, Jerry is pleased with the results. I'm able to cope with everyday stresses a lot better than I was six months ago before I started coming here. Army veteran Jeff Bachman served our country during the Bosnian conflict. I was a light infantry squad leader, um, so it's one of those guys who carry a large backpack and a rifle everywhere. Um, best job I ever had in my life. Jeff saw firsthand the ethnic cleansing that occurred in Bosnia. After returning home, he tried to put those memories behind him. I excelled when I was, had something to do when I was in college and grad school. Those things kept me busy following that. Once I, my mind had a chance to work on its own, it decided to uh, take over and uh, essentially crumble my life quite a bit. Jeff is actively involved at the Veterans Alternative Center. He enjoys the camaraderie and activities like this eye rest meditation. He too tried accelerated resolution therapy. What I noticed probably right off the bat was I was very calm um, coming out of the very first session. Where I really began to notice it was about the third session. So you walk out of the room, you do feel a lot better, but I woke up the next day and I was like, wow, I really slept the whole night. And it was honestly a sense of peace that came over probably for the first time in about 10 years. The center was founded by Brian Anderson, who also sought relief from the memories of war. I was, I was desperate, you know, I was a Green Beret. I'm a barrel-chested freedom fighter. Um, supposed to be, you know, physically, mentally, um, spiritually tough. Inside, I was just going through a ton of turmoil. When he learned about ART, he immediately decided to try this novel approach. It, it saved my life and I, I wanted to make sure that other warriors had that same opportunity. Dr. Kibb shares his findings by speaking at conferences and having his research validated. We've done three studies, uh, published uh, seven papers, and as a result of the evidence we've acquired, now we're federally recognized as an effective evidence-based treatment for both post-traumatic stress and depression. Accelerated resolution therapy may be relatively new, but the results are undeniable.
It's everything from people reuniting with their families again, people being able to socialize, be able to come here and have the camaraderie, you know, with fellow veterans, um, their anxieties decreasing, their depressions decreasing. Rising sea levels present a unique problem for coastal cities, and solutions come with trade-offs and consequences. A documentary produced by WPSU examines the impact of human intervention in a region already feeling the effects of a warming planet. Here's an excerpt from Managing Risk in a Changing Climate. After much evaluation and deliberation, the first master plan unveiled an integrated portfolio of over 100 coastal protection and restoration projects designed to work together. The most direct method of building land is mechanical marsh creation, pumping dredge sand and sediment through pipelines directly into sinking wetlands. And they've been able to build what had become open water, rebuild these areas two feet above sea level in about 700 acres in about six or seven months, and the plants have come back in. That's proven to work, and of course, the downside of that is as it subsides, you have to redo it again in about 30 years. But mechanical methods have their critics, saying they're expensive, burn fossil fuels, and cannot build land fast enough to keep up with subsidence and sea level rise. So the master plan also calls for river diversions, a technique that uses the Mississippi River itself to deliver sediments to rebuild the delta. There's a finite number of tools in our toolbox for coastal restoration. In a place where you have the river, it makes a lot of sense to use the river. 24 miles downriver from New Orleans in Plaquemin Parish is the Carnarvon Diversion. Here, engineers created a break in the levee, and when they open the gate, fresh river water and its sediments flow into the wetlands, building the land and giving plant life a foothold. So we're in a small channel in the middle of this large area that we now call the Carnarvon Delta. And if you were here just uh, five or 10 years ago, this would have been all open water, you know, for a half mile in every direction. Since this is kind of symbolic of our new delta and new land, uh, we decided to call this Bayou Bonjour. So welcome to, to the new bayou. And this is something that we can now put on a map rather than take something off the map. But there's a trade-off here too. River diversions change the salinity of the estuary environment, threatening oyster fisheries and game fish, damaging a valuable ecosystem service, with the cost falling on one group of stakeholders. There's a lot of unproven methods that we are having a problem with, and that's river diversions. And that's what they're focusing their efforts on, and the most money uh, is going to the engineering design of these river diversions. That will, in effect, wipe out our fishing resources. This parish relies on a tax base from its commercial and recreational fishing industries. If we don't have that, we, we, we have nothing. We're off the map. After multiple scientific studies, computer model analyses, and contentious public debate, the state ultimately identified areas they felt would benefit from river diversions and began construction. It's honing in on what really matters and trying to get to those key trade-offs. So this is about not using the science to conclusively answer policy questions. It's truly using the science to inform uh, the conversations that are happening and making sure that it's the right science and it's coming at the right time. To watch the entire documentary, head to wpsu.org slash changing climate. As always, you can watch complete episodes of SciTech Now on demand and online at wpsu.org slash digital. I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station.